welcome to day three of our series of special reports on hymns of the church. I am Dolores Hodges, your host for this evening of special presentations. Today's theme continues a focus on worship, the expression of our heart to God in the midst of life's challenges, trials, joys, and triumphs. Hymns invite everyone present in the service to join in, to lift their voices in one accord to the glory of God. As stated before, great hymns of worship lift us up and bring us before the face of God. The lyrics stir our emotions and provoke our moral responsibility. Wherever you are, come and worship the Lord as we listen to these powerful reminders of God with us. Good evening. I am Kyle Polo here to present the special introduction of Love Lifted Me. Mr. James Rowe, 1865 through 1933, was born in England and immigrated to the United States in 1889. His text for this song was inspired by two biblical stories. The first is Matthew 14, 22 through 33, where the disciples were in a boat in the middle of a frightening storm and saw Jesus walking on the sea. Peter also began walking on the water at Jesus' command. He began to sink when he took his eyes off Jesus, then called out to Jesus to save him. Jesus caught Peter by the hand and lifted him up. As they got into the boat, the second story is Matthew 8, 23 through 27, in which Jesus is asleep in the boat while the disciples are frightened by a powerful threatening storm. They wake Jesus and ask him to help them. Jesus rebukes the storm. This hymn matches fully and incorporates both stories using Peter sinking as an illustration for sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more. Jesus, master of the sea, here's our pleas for help, reaches out to us in love and lifts us up. We have a special quartet of Gail McDowell, Diane Gibbs, Corey Leak, and George Dorsey to perform this hymn. Listen and be inspired. I'm Lauren Cornelius, and I have the honor of presenting information on the hymn, Take the Name of Jesus with You. 
Lydia Odell Baxter, the writer, was born in Petersburg, New York on September 8, 1809. As a young woman, she and her sister were converted by the preaching of a traveling Baptist missionary, and a while later, the two sisters were mainly responsible for the establishment of a Baptist church in their hometown. All who knew Lydia said that her radiance was an inspiration to them. Due to a serious illness, she became partial invalid and was confined to her bed much of the time. Her home was a gathering place for preachers and other religious works who came to her for advice. Because of her patient cheerfulness, people often visited her sick room, not so much to comfort her, her as to be blessed by her. Lydia was a housewife. In 1855, she published a collection of religious poetry, Gems by the Wayside. She also produced a number of gospel songs, such as There is a Gate Ajar for Me. In 1870, she penned Take the Name of Jesus with You. An avid student of the Bible, Lydia often engaged in discussions of scriptural names with her friends and felt the very utterance of the name of Jesus carried her to a deeper understanding. Saying, when she tempered tries to make me blue or despondent, I mention the name of Jesus, and he cannot get through me cannot get through to me anymore. See if her testimony has the same effect on you while you listen to take the name of Jesus with you. Good evening. I'm Colby Cottle for The Good News with a special report on the hymn, Higher Ground. This hymn, written by Johnson Altman Jr., has been a favorite with many Christians since it was first published in 1898. It is a great expression of one's desire for a more profound spiritual life, growing further with Christ. Johnson Altman Jr., a member of the Methodist Episcopal Church, was a businessman. He was licensed to preach and was ordained by his denomination, although he never actually pastored a church. His father was an exceptional singer. Inspired by his father's talents, Oatman would later embark on writing gospel songs. From 1892, when he started, until he passed away in 1922, he was able to write over 3,000 hymn lyrics. It is reported that Oatman generally averaged four to five new texts each week, receiving no more than one dollar for each of his songs. His texts were always in great demand by the leading gospel musicians of his day. One of his greatest compositions was Higher Ground. It expresses so well this universal desire for a deeper spiritual life, continuing on a higher plane of fellowship with God than we have ever experienced before. This hymn is filled with optimism and great aspirations to be fully consecrated to God. Set your spiritual goals high and press on to higher ground. Here to perform this hymn on piano is Miss D. Hunter.
Did you know the word hymn comes from the Greek word hymnos, which means a song of praise? Originally, these would have been written in honor of the gods the people worship, reflecting their culture and beliefs. The singing or composition of hymns has evolved and changed through the years, affected by new thinking and developing religious beliefs. Throughout the history of the church, whenever there has been renewal, revival, or restoration, new songs of worship have appeared. Worship the Lord and exalt his name as we continue together. Let us continue our exploration of hymns. Good evening and welcome. I'm Danielle Hager for the good news with the special report on the hymn, Even Me. This is a hymn which emphasizes the refreshing blessings of grace that come from the presence of the Lord. The hymn's author, Elizabeth Harris, was born in 1824 in England and at age 17 was editing a magazine for the Patagonia Mission and the South American Missionary Society. She married a pastor, Rev. Daniel Conder, and began working in a Protestant mission in London where she edited the monthly woman's newspaper. She wrote Even Me in the summer of 18, 18, 1860 during a time of prayer, interested in the spiritual welfare of a group of young people who were attending a church meeting. She urged the, them to share in the blessings of which they had heard Mrs. Connor's original hymn had seven stanzas. The sixth stanza rounds out the Trinitarian structure that deals with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As an expression of humility, even me recognizes the total unworthiness of the supplicant. It's as though the one praying is saying, Lord, you're blessing many others so freely. As for me and myself, I'm not worthy of the least of your favors. But perhaps as the blessings rain down, you could spare a few drops, even for me. What a powerful request. Listen to Mr. Dezel Leans forward and see if you find yourself in the words of this hymn. Good evening. 
I am Mary Mullins for the Good News Special Reports to present information on the hymn, Ferris Lord Jesus. This hymn has stood the test of time for over 300 years and continues to be used in church services. The tune enchants the heart and the text transcends time. What could be more beautiful than meadows in springtime? Sunbeams are twinkling stars. Jesus, ruler of all nature. He shines purer than all the angels heaven can boast. The hymn has a long and complex past, multiple translations, and tunes currently circulate. There is no record of authors for either the text or tune. Jesus is identified as both from God and the Son of Man. A reference kind of commonly understood as indicating Christ's two natures, divine and human. Scholars find the origins of this concept in Daniel 7 with various New Testament references such as Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. Good News Translation. Christ often refers to himself as the Son of Man. The remainder of the stanza makes the Son of God and Son of Man the object of our adoration. My soul's glory, joy, and crown. Stanza 2 extols the beauty of the natural created order, such as the meadows and woodland. Contrasts this natural beauty with that of Jesus, who is fairer and purer. Concluding with a powerful metaphor, Jesus makes the woeful heart to sing. In the third stanza, our eyes are lifted to the heavens, the sun, moon, and stars. Again, the comparison is that Jesus outshines the brightest lights of the heavens and is purer than all the angels of heaven. Reverend Carmen Battle is back again to play this hymn for you. Why not sing along with her and let it take you back
Hello, I am Laverne Weldon with the final hymn for this evening. It is a powerful hymn that is near and dear to many Christians. Sarah Flower Adams, the writer, showed an early talent for poetry and her sister Eliza for music. At church, the sisters helped their pastor, Reverend Fox, prepare a hymn book called the 1841 Hymns and Anthems. Sarah contributed 13 hymn lyrics and Eliza 62 hymn tunes. Reverend Fox then asked the sisters to write a new hymn on the story of Jacob and Esau that could accompany a sermon that he was planning to preach on the subject. In preparation, Sarah began reading the Bible account very carefully. So, Nearer My God to Thee started out as a poem written by Sarah Flower Adams, based on Jacob's dream. As presented in Genesis 28th chapter, verses 11 through 19. Each stanza ends with a, re a repetition of the opening line to re-emphasize the main thought of wanting to be nearer to God in our lives here on earth with the hope of being with Him in eternity. This is an example of how the hymn's lyrics match up with the story Genesis. Jacob was on the run from his twin brother Esau who vowed to kill Jacob for taking his birthright and stealing his blessing from their dying father. Sarah wrote, Though like the wanderer, the sun gone down, darkness be over me, my rest a stone, yet in my dreams I'd be nearer my God to thee. Jacob settled down to rest on his journey. He dreamed of a ladder coming down from heaven with angels descending and ascending upon it. These are Sarah's lyrics. There let the way appear, steps unto heaven. All that thou sendest me, in mercy given. Angels to beckon me, nearer my God to thee. The remaining stanzas continue to describe the Genesis story. And finally, though disputed by some, legend has it that the band on board the Titanic played this hymn as the great ship went down on April 15, 1912. Listen now as Harry Taylor plays this moving hymn for us.
a privilege we have had today. We have experienced many different aspects of relationships with God, all established by God's unconditional love and care for his children. As we close tonight, we can continue to worship and encourage you to tune in tomorrow for another special report. Our theme will be prophetic and declarative hymns. You don't want to miss it. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. May you continue to be blessed by what you have seen and heard. I am Dolores Hodges for the good news.